make sure to give my dad a five star review. Get, make sure to like and subscribe to his YouTube. Thank, thank you for listening and enjoy the, the show. show. <laughs> At some point, any historian has to make a decision and say, do I see enough reasons, do I see enough evidence in what can be tested to give this document the benefit of the doubt in the places where it can't be tested? And the authors of our world civilization textbooks, whether they know they're doing that or not, uh, many times they're just relying on earlier textbooks. Um, but somewhere back in the day when people thought seriously about these things, uh, <laughs> they uh, said, yes, we've got enough material in the lives of the Caesars that ring. We can also see when they bring us details that cut against the grain, that potentially weaken the ideologies that they're supporting. And they probably wouldn't have included that unless it was true and important. Um, we get to a stage where we say, unless we have some serious reason for doubting a specific piece of information, um, we will give it the benefit of the doubt because you're not going to be able to test everything. You're not going to be able to confirm or disconfirm everything. Uh, the Bible, uh, especially the historical parts of the New Testament, the Gospels and Acts, um, have filled so many volumes of scholarship with those kinds of things that can be tested. And it's very Hello, faithful politics listeners and viewers. If you're joining us via YouTube, so glad to have you here today. And I'm excited to be here. I'm Josh, the faithful host. We have political host Will Wright with us. Will, good to see you again. Yep, yep. yep. Always good to see you. And we have a treat today because we get to do part two of a podcast that we did before with Professor Craig Blomberg. Craig, Professor uh, Craig Blomberg is um, a professor emeritus of New Testament at the Denver Theological Seminary, um, Denver, Denver Seminary, and he has completed his PhD in New Testament, specializing in the parables and writings of Luke Acts at Aberdeen University in Scotland. He received an MA from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and a Bachelor's of Arts from Augustana College before joining, joining the faculty of Denver Seminary, he taught at Palm Beach Atlanta College, and was a research fellow in Cambridge, England with Tyndale House. In addition to writing numerous articles in professional journals, multi-author works in dictionaries or encyclopedias. He's authored or edited at least 20 books, including the historical reliability of the Gospels, interpreting the parables and commentaries on Matthew, 1 Corinthians, and James, among many others. Thank you so much for joining us again, Dr. Blomberg. Craig, thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. Well, that's great. So last time we were talking, I just couldn't stop asking all these questions. I was like a fanboy. Like we got this guy who knows he's like one of the top scholars in, in Jesus research and people, a lot of people wouldn't care, but to me, that's like, you're like Michael Jordan. So I had to get, uh, I, I, I need to get you to sign my book of the historical reliabilities of the gospels. That's not a comparison I think anybody has ever made in my entire life. Although, as I was growing up, basketball was my my favorite participation sport. And there if you I go. had known there was going to be a guy like Michael Jordan come along, I might have aspired to be like him. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if he had been born yet. <laughs> I'm at, yeah, that's true, dude. I don't know either. How old is Michael Jordan? But then we'll have to figure out how old Dr. Blomberg is. And we're, we're not going to do that on this. Uh, I turned 68 yesterday. 
Oh, well, there you go. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Happy belated birthday. Thank yeah. you. That's awesome. Well, thanks again for coming back. And we wanted to get kind of dig into your book that you've written in our first podcast. We talked a lot about kind of the first part of the book and half of the book, which talks about the history of the Jesus movements and the, and the, um, the searches for uh, Jesus, the quest, right, for the historical Jesus and the several quests that we've had, one, two, three, four. We kind of talked about those. And now we're going to talk more about your book that you've written, Jesus, the Purifier. And um, I got to ask, you know, what was it about this topic that made you want to write a book about purity purity codes, Jesus as a purifier, anything to do with purity. It's just, I got to say, I've never thought about writing a book on purity, probably because I feel like I'd be the last person that could write a book on purity. So um, let's talk about that. What what do you mean by purity? And why did you write this book? Back in the mid 2000s, I uh, published uh, something smaller that was called Contagious Holiness, Jesus Meals with Sinners. And it really was uh, a fascinating study, uh, spent a lot of time in Old Testament and then Jewish and Greco-Roman backgrounds. And I tried to develop the contrast that in Jesus' world, just about everybody, certainly in the Jewish world, but even beyond that, um, understood a concept that is absolutely foreign to our modern world. And that is there are things that make you ritually defiled, and there are rituals that you have to undergo to become uh, purified from those. Um, So if... uh, Christians ever take the time to go to uh, the book of Leviticus, I know it's uh, not that popular, Uh, you learn all about how touching a corpse uh, or having uh, unusual bodily emissions or eating the wrong foods or by extension, sometimes associating with people who eat the wrong foods or having mold in your house, or having a defiling skin disease, um, all of these things and others uh, made you ritually unclean. It wasn't necessarily seen as something sinful, but it was seen as something that was, well, some scholars have suspected uh, that it was just viewed as disgusting things that... uh, you had to be Hmm. purified from. And so it was natural to develop the mindset that um, one goes through life along with everything else that one does, semi-conscious at most times that there was some way something outside of you could corrupt you and you had to be on guard. And Jesus comes along and little by little does away with all of that and says, no, it's what comes out of the heart. It's what you speak. It's what you do. It's moral things that corrupt a person. But you've got the ability with the power of the spirit um, not to make corruption and disease the most contagious thing around, but to make holiness and purity and wholesomeness and winsomeness um, the most contagious thing around and have a a good effect on others, that's what you should be more concerned about than worrying about them having a bad effect on you. So um, this was just a natural continuation of that because I had not... uh, done very much at all with the the Gospel of John in uh, that earlier book. And in this one, it's, uh, except for one final chapter, almost all about John. Yeah, so I want to get into that, thinking about the Gospel of John and kind of work through this concept of purity, how it shows up there, and then bring to some practical implications, especially thinking about the 
political part of our lives and how we connect with the people around us and things like that. But help us understand purity a little bit more. So like I've heard in the past things like, for instance, like that, uh, I think she was an anthropologist or something along those lines, but Mary Douglas, I believe, talking about purity being a, uh, about things being out of order, disorder, right. they're not in their right place. What is a way, a, a, a contemporary, um, illustration or example that I know it, nothing contemporary probably um, map, you know, uh, section to section over what purity was back then, but what would be something that we would uh, be able to relate to today when we're thinking about purity as the Bible describes it? Well, I, I, the first thing I think of are, are people with visible disabilities Um Mm. have have little kids with you who don't have filters uh, and haven't been taught what they're supposed to say and not say and suddenly you see a young adult with down syndrome and maybe uh, they're trying to talk and maybe they're doing it in a loud voice and maybe it's only semi-intelligible and all of a sudden your four-year-old turns to you and says what's wrong with that person <laughs> um, and you go, Shh, right. You're not supposed to say that. Um, uh, yes. I've been in that situation more than once. <laughs> um, or, uh, I, I can imagine, uh, my, uh, two, four year old granddaughters at the moment, uh, being brought up in, uh, the South of England where, uh, they don't automatically immunize for chicken pox, uh, are both filled with chicken pox right now. And, uh, of course they're probably not going to be going out in public too much, but I could easily imagine, uh, another kid their age, if they saw him going, what are all those bumps all over your body? <laughs> right. <laughs> that's awesome. You, you know, that that's, that's so funny. It reminded me of, um, a few years ago, I've, so I've got two two boys, and um, um, they're nine and seven. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, a few years ago, we were we were watching uh, America's Got Talent. It's sort of like one of the yeah. shows that, that, that we like watching as a family. And and anyways, there is this person that walked out on stage, and he had um, a physical disability. His arms were were sort of short or something mm. like. And um, my kids, you know, were, were asking questions and they were kind of chuckling. And I, I looked at them and I, I sternly said, like, <laughs> you don't, you know, laugh at people that are different than you. You know, like, we're better than that as a family. Well, it turns out he was a comedian. <laughs> so, so sure, surely thereafter, like, my wife and I were laughing at <laughs> And I'm like, my, my kids didn't understand the jokes. And, and we just felt like I, we, it was a major parenting fail at that moment. <laughs> but, 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 but had he turned out to be one of these people that suddenly became an operatic singer, then. Uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, why couldn't you have done that? You know, why couldn't you have done something not funny? But right. he, was really, he was really good, too. I can't remember his name, but uh, he was really good. Um, but but I want I, I, I want to I wanna go back to something that you 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 mentioned earlier about like these different things the bible says you know are like unclean like is there is there a difference in the way that the bible refers to things that are unclean and and like sin because you know i i'm not i'm not a bible expert i'm just a guy that follows politics probably to his own detriment but like um <laughs> is, is there like are are there parallels there and are we like misinterpreting what Leviticus says as far as what's a sin versus what's what's unclean? Well, uh, the problem is that that, yes, there are uh, words that normally mean one or the other, but there are also words that are used in both contexts. And so and, and the same is true in English. Um, if I uh, say that my house has mold um probably nobody's going to think that somebody has sinned. Um, uh, who right. knows? Maybe the, uh, the building know didn't people. put in the right kind of uh, protective uh, insulation or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah, if I, if I talk about uh, 
a defiling skin disease, uh, which is one way that uh, uh, English translations try to deal with leprosy, because as far as we can tell, um, the concept was much broader than just that one disease. Um, So if I read something about a defiling skin disease, I suspect the average 21st century reader is going to say, oh, okay, that's not a sin. That's that's a disease. Right. I get the difference. Um, But what if I eat pork? What if I eat a food that I'm not supposed to? Um, What will the modern reader tend to think about that? Um, You disobeyed a direct commandment if I'm an Orthodox Jew and I do that. So in that sense, yeah, I'm rebelling against God, so I'm sinning. Um, But the remedy is not to pray a prayer of confession like David did in Psalm 51. Um, The remedy is uh, wait a week or if it wasn't a serious offense, wait a day and go have a, go immerse yourself in a ritual pool um, and uh, have a priest declare you clean. Well, what do, what do we have that's a direct equivalent to that? Um, I, not, it's not hard to much. say. And so we tend to think just about the sin side Um and sometimes, yeah, if I am knowingly obeying, uh, disobeying a direct command of God, then then it is a sin. Um, if my work, uh, if I come across a, a person who seems to be motionless uh, on the ground, um, and it turns out I've touched a corpse. Well, that wouldn't have been viewed as sinful. I was going there to see if it was somebody who needed help uh, and I could help him some way. I took the pulse and, oh, my gosh, there's no pulse. Uh, so the ancient Jew wouldn't have looked at that as, as something sinful, but it still was defiling. It's like, ooh, I touched a dead body. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, might have my, the same reaction my, today. My kids, huh? my kids again would would probably have said that's disgusting, and and yes, that would have been the attitude that many adults would have had, even if they wouldn't have said it out loud. <laughs> Absolutely. And so one of my questions is, uh, oh, sorry, Craig, go ahead. Were you, did you have something you wanted no, to add there? No. So one of my questions. So thinking about this, and, and then I, I'm going to ask this and then move over into kind of transition into the Gospels and John. But if so, my understanding was that most of these purity laws, like many of them, had some kind of connection with idol worship. For instance, something like don't cook. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not the purity laws. Some did. I, I don't know that I would say most, but some certainly did. <laughs> Like, I guess what, so, because I guess what I'm saying is like, I, if I'm taking this and I'm trying to apply it today, right. And I'm seeing something in Exodus that says, don't cook a goat in its mother's milk. Maybe that's not a purity thing. That's more of a worship thing. Right. So how do I interpret that? Well, that's a worship. Well, now don't take two, you know, skin defiling diseases and having two different kinds of, you know, the classic things, having two different kinds of fabric in your clothes, things like that. Were those like, how do we preach those? I guess, how how do I talk about those? Like, are they about idolatry? Are they about something else going on? What, what, what do you think about that? As I, as I understand it, uh, what, what I like to call the, the don't mix and match uh, principles um, were somewhat unique to the children of Israel as a way of saying, you are my elect people. Um, you are to be different from the nations around you. Well, um, morally, there were things that were considered repugnant in 
all the nations uh, surrounding Israel. That didn't mean that everybody obeyed them, but you look at the Code of Hammurabi, which is the, the famous ancient law code that people will often compare with the Ten Commandments, and you'll see a bunch of them are, are the same. Uh, there were differences as well. But um, the ones where you don't find any parallels uh, any place else, like why wouldn't you... Uh, so one field with two kinds of grain, if you've got enough space for it and both right. grow equally well. Um, it was the sense of purity. It was the sense of we want something that's a visible demonstration. Everything is of one kind. Your clothing is all of one kind. Um, to this day, the Orthodox Jew does not have milk and meat dishes at the same meal. And that is an outgrowth of don't boil uh, a kid, a baby goat in its mother's milk. It's, it's, it's a wrong kind of, of mixing and matching. Um, there are probably other reasons behind that command uh, originally also, but uh that's the that's the legacy. It is a way of talking about purity, and Jesus comes along and begins, uh, and and certainly throughout his entire uh, earthly life, uh, precisely because uh, we believe he was sinless and therefore completely obeyed the law of Moses while it was still in force, uh, he would have followed all of those laws. But he did not follow the additional traditions that the Pharisees had added that would later get written down in things like the Mishnah. And he often um, blasted them for their additions, which he took to be misinterpretations and, and misapplications, and then set the stage for, in the era of the coming of the Spirit in a new way, uh, to move beyond those laws that were strictly about things uh, of ritual purity and really didn't have any moral value at all. Um, I firmly believe that the three of us uh, sitting here with clothes that are made of two kinds of fabric, um, even if your shirt's uh, all made out of Malcolm will uh, or whatever it's made out of, uh, <laughs> you probably have socks on that are made out of something else. But <laughs> it's true. Definitely. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because you have uh, – what I'm hearing you say is that these purity laws that so many people take and they try to make them show how, you know, the Bible's inconsistent. I just hear that a lot. Right. Or how we're inconsistent in applying the Bible today, especially when it comes to LGBTQIA issues. Right. And we go back to Leviticus in those places if we do that. Um, and, and, and it said, well, how can you do that? Look at these purity laws and all this stuff which I don't think is a good argument, but I see that and I hear that a lot. And what I'm hearing from you is that, yeah, these laws, especially these ones about, you know, having not mixing and matching, these have to do with God's people being unique among the nations. Right. That's right. The other nations would mix clothing. The other nations yep. would grow all yep. sorts of different crops so that they could make sure they had the most amount and could make the amount. But it's almost like, no, you grow this because you trust me. You don't use the strategies of those nations. You use what I tell you and I will give you success Would that. Would you say that was accurate? Sure. And uh, since you guys like controversy, I mean, you can uh, you can do it with uh, the Sabbath laws as well. Mm. Um, certainly by New Testament times, uh, there was no country anywhere in the uh, Roman Empire's orbit that had one day of rest out of seven. They had various holidays every month. They didn't require their people to work nonstop, but uh, there was not this cycle of, of one day of rest. Well, what's that all about? Well, it's about worship. It's about rest. Yes. And it's also about 
earning one seventh less hmm. of an income than you would be able to otherwise. And we tend to forget about that. It's about trusting God to be able to provide, even though you're not working flat out the absolute most number of hours that you can. Wow, that's so interesting. So, um, so I, I have a question kind of about interpretations and, uh, I think Josh sort of quickly alluded to it earlier, but, um, so I, I'm, I'm not necessarily formally trained in theology or anything like that. You know, I help with that. (laughs) <laughs> I read, you know, like I, I, I read the dummies guide to the Bible and, um, it's I'm, not bad. I've, I've, I've been known to do, I, I don't know what they call it, but it's like, you know, when, when like you're going through something and you just flip through the pages and you find a verse and you're like, okay, that's the verse that's going to speak to me. Like, Cherry picking or yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Proof texting. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm curious on, how does the Bible interpret certain, you know, and or how, how does the Bible interpret current like societal issues um, that are, you know, in our our normal everyday media, um, political discourse, what 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 have you? Um, and you can kind of go as as deeper or not deep as you want, especially centered around like gay marriage um, and immigration, if I, you know. Just grab two random ones. Well, to tie that in with uh, the comment Josh made, um, you really do need to keep in mind that the Bible is made up of two testaments. Um, There's the old and there's the new. What what makes uh, a Christian who wants to follow the Bible different from an Orthodox Jew? Um, we have a second testament. We've got we've got a bigger Bible, and it has been the historic belief of Christianity that um, you never solve any problem, uh, you never give any piece of advice, you never uh, define uh, what it means to follow God simply by turning to the Old Testament. Now, sadly, there are folks who've swung the pendulum too far in the opposite direction, and they never look at the Old Testament, and they think you can jettison it. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, which may be the, the most significant verse in in this conversation, uh, don't think that I came to abolish the law. I, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, But then you might think he was preparing to say, I came to preserve them intact. But that's not what he says. He says, I came to fulfill them. I came. Oh, no. Wait a minute. You fulfill prophecy. What what does it mean to fulfill a law? Well, it means to bring to completion the full meaning of its original intention. And so that'll preach. Do I eat shrimp today? I had some last night at a restaurant that my family took me to for my birthday. Um, I did so without any pangs of conscience whatsoever, even though uh, shellfish uh, is one of the things forbidden in, uh, in the law. Because I understand that Jesus came and, as Mark 7, 19 puts it, declared all foods clean. Um, So then does that mean that those uh, lengthy chapters, uh, I think it's Leviticus 15 in particular, that that lists all of the, uh, the unclean animals, that that has no meaning for the believer. Now I've got to deal with with Second Timothy, uh, three sixteen. It says all Scripture is inspired and profitable for reproof, rebuke, correction, training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be equipped for every good work. So there must be something there for me, and what. Jesus helps us to see and the apostles after him in the New Testament is that the ritual law was a setup 
to prepare people already in the Old Testament times, but certainly now, uh, to be thinking about moral law. There was something symbolic about being ritually pure and clean that that made you uh, whole before God. And the way people are whole today is, is by being morally clean and upright. Um, so to go back to, to Josh's example, I've often baited classes with that, that very issue. If the only comment in Scripture relevant to uh, same-sex uh, sexual uh, consummation was in Leviticus, I might have great difficulty determining what the Christian's attitude to that should be. Um, I might come down with saying, oh, well, as I look at all of the other laws of that chapter, it's a long list of people I shouldn't have sex with, and a lot of them have to do with people that are too close a relative, hmm. um, that that maybe the application today would be quite different. But that's not the situation that I'm faced with. I've got a whole bunch of New Testament passages that I have to deal with also. Um, so leading with Leviticus 18 is really not a, a good approach uh, to uh, the question of same-sex uh, behavior. Um, start with the New Testament passages that are obviously for believers. Um, I'll stop there. <laughs> you can you can move from there. Well, I mean, I love it because what well, I mean, what I hear you saying is that if we just had Leviticus, that was the only thing we had, meaning and, and attaching to a principle like if there's one verse that says this, don't attach this entire doctrine to this one verse and say this is absolute because we because we may not be interpreting that one correctly. And the more instances we have of something, the more sure we can be that we need to deal with these things like dealing with the data. And it made me think almost taking like in our in our in our new um, in, in this new era that we have that we're dealing with as a church is almost taking like, okay, I want to be able to bring in the full, the fullness of everybody who confesses Jesus as their Lord, right? What, whatever their orientation, whatever they feel about themselves, they're confessing Jesus as Lord. We want this to door to be as open as possible. And yet we need to start though. We can start with, yes, we'd like you to do that, but we need to deal honestly with the data and, and move and see what it's actually saying to us. Because I think one, one of the things that happens is that we suppose that like a lot of people would just suppose, well, the Bible is against homosexual. So I'm not even going to look at the data because I already know what it's going to say. So we've predetermined what it's going to say. And, and instead of saying, let me, let me wrestle with it. Let me, let me, let me look at it. Let me wrestle with it. Um, do you have any comment on that before I move on to talk yeah, about the gospels? I mean, uh, two things quickly. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make is understanding the old Testament in light of the new, um, certainly <clears throat> there's, there's something to be said if you've got a, a topic and you can only find one passage anywhere in the Bible, um, <laughs> That's relevant. Yeah, a lot is riding on the fact that you better interpret it correctly. Yes. Um, but that that wasn't my point. My point was there could have been um, 25 passages rather than one in the Old Testament that said you shall not get a tattoo. And unless um, I figure out if that still is valid for the New Testament age, I don't know what to do with it. Um, right. So I've, I've got right. to bring the New Testament to bear on it. Um, the the other point that that I think, uh, since you brought up the the issue of uh, uh, LGBTQ, um, let it be said that was not my decision to bring that up. Um, <laughs> is, uh, it is said. It is uh, that there's not a word in either testament 
about same-sex attraction, about what we today call orientation. Mm, What every passage talks about is sexual behavior. There are certain behaviors that displease God, and there are certain behaviors sexually that heterosexuals commit that displease God. Um, So let's, yeah, before you say, I won't read the Bible, because I know... uh, um, it's going to be against homosexuality. Well, if somebody has said that, they have not represented the Bible accurately. It does appear that the Bible is against certain forms of sexual behavior, and every one of us has something to learn from what the Bible says uh, about that, whatever our orientation might be. Right, because orientation is this modern kind of constant phenomenon. Will, did you want to say something? No, I, I, uh, I, I love that. And, you know, as you were talking, it was we spoke with a person recently about separation of church and state. And uh, he he made a comment about, you know, well, that's that's not listed anywhere in the Constitution. And and he's correct. You know, a letter written by Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist. Um, And so a lot of people kind of take that. And say, well, you know, church state separation wasn't in the Constitution. So, like, what's the big to do? And and I and a lot of those same people would likely have very strong views about LGBTQ from a biblical perspective. Um, whereas what you just said was it's not it's, you know, it's not really addressed in, in the Bible. And I just thought that was that was fascinating. So I, I definitely appreciate you uh, you kind of clarifying that. And, and there are fascinating, um, there's a man by the name of Yaroslav Pelikan, P-E-L-I-K-A-N, uh, who's passed away a few years ago, but he was probably the leading scholar um, of... Eastern Orthodoxy uh, in America. I think he taught at Yale back in the day. But he wrote a little book um, comparing the Bible and the Constitution and comparing approaches that people use in interpreting both documents. And there are some some very, very fascinating parallels. Um, Yeah, there's the Constitution. And then you can amend the Constitution. And I don't want to say that the New Testament is the amended Old Testament, but <laughs> but there are some, some ways that works. That concept works. There are some interesting parallels there. Um, we would not have the abolition of slavery apart from the amendments. We would not have women's right to vote apart from amendments. I don't know if the the people you have in mind. Uh, would be against those developments or not. Um, But the point is that um, in 2023 and basically going right back to the beginning, the authoritative documents for American politics are the Constitution plus its amendments. A lot more than that, but but that's a good starting point. <laughs> yes. And uh, the same way uh, for Christian, it's the Old Testament plus its fulfillment in the New Testament. That's so. I, I that's so good. So with the Gospels, let's shift to the Gospels, right, and move in. So, I. The Gospel of John, you focused on this, you focused on purity, which the idea of contagious purity, I love that. So I want to dig into that. Hmm. But you'll look at the Gospels and you'll say um, the three are really similar and the fourth is really different. And so you'll have a lot of people say, well, that means John made up the fourth or, you know, or it wasn't John, right? It was the writer of the Gospel of John or whatever that, you know, um, they've made up the fourth gospel um, or it's just like it's 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 uh, all just, it's so amended. It's so redacted that there's no way we could get to the quote unquote epissima verba. Right. Or ips- how do you say that? I said that wrong. Epissima verba or even the authentic voice, which is sometimes yeah, the authentic the box. Yeah, the voice or the words, right? Ver- words voices versus voice. Because right. we don't have the words, right? Because he didn't probably speak those in Greek, but it was written probably in Greek. Greek so too. we. <laughs> so 
my question is, what do we do? Like, even like, what do we do with this difference between these gospels for the people who have no idea? And they would hear someone say, oh, the fourth gospel is so different. It's not even talking about the historical Jesus. Well, that's where you go back to a, a different book that I wrote 20 years ago called The Historical Reliability of John's Gospel. Um, at first blush, there are uh, a lot of differences. And one of the things, certainly not the main thing to say, but, but one of the things that's important is John seems very different particularly if you are familiar with all three of his predecessors, because it feels like now it's three versus one. But imagine that all you had was Mark and John. They would be different. How different would they feel? Would you naturally gravitate toward one over the other? Because there's no momentum that's been created by the fact that Matthew and Luke, uh, for whatever reasons, deliberately chose to follow uh, Mark's actual wording and choice of passages and sequence of passages more often than not. John, who was probably largely at a literary level independent of the synoptics, chose not to do that. Um, he knew what had already been written for whatever reasons. He chose largely to supplement uh, and tell different things. But then you have to ask, OK, let's let's line these different things up. Um, let's go to. Uh, John 3 and 4, uh, two fairly long chapters dominated by Jesus' dialogue with Nicodemus and uh, its aftermath and with the woman at the well in Samaria. No parallel in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. What do we know about Nicodemus? Well, we know from the Jewish writings that he was a real guy. He came from a wealthy Pharisaic family. And in fact, uh, his grandfather was also na named Nicodemus. His father was named Gurion, uh, the same uh, famous family that David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, uh, took his name from. And if you, go to wow. Tel if you go to Tel Aviv today, you'll fly into Ben-Gurion Airport, uh, wow. named after the modern uh, David Ben-Gurion. Uh, this is not a, a legendary family, you'll find that at the very core of the whole debate uh, between Jesus and Nicodemus is his claim, unless you are born, and truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. John only uses the expression kingdom of God three times in his whole gospel. Two of them are in John 3. Hmm. Suddenly, that sounds strikingly like what Jesus says in Matthew 18, unless you become hmm. like a little child. He actually prefaces it with that same truly. Um, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, very similar. So, yes, John is recording an incident that uh, actually happened before Jesus' major public ministry got underway. Is what he says really out of character? Well, John writes it up in his own words, and his Greek style is different, but... No, there's, there's a point of contact very uh, close at hand to uh, what we see in the Gospels, but he introduces the concept of water, born of water in the Spirit, water that brought so much ritual purity. John the Baptist baptized people in water. What would, what would a Jew think of? 
Well, you would think of what he had to do regularly throughout his life, be immersed in water when his time was up uh, after some defilement so that he would be ritually pure again. Um, this kind of baptism was hardly unusual. That's, that's not what made John striking. What made John's message striking was he said, every single Jew, even if you haven't broken one of these ritual laws in years, you've got to be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. He moves it into a moral dimension. And then John has discussion with the Samaritan woman at the well. A Samaritan woman. Wow. One of the things that makes Jesus striking in the Synoptic Gospels, particularly in Luke, is his positive view towards Samaritans. Ten lepers, Luke chapter 17. He cleanses them all. Oh, that's also about ritual purity. Only the Samaritan comes back to give thanks. Apparently, only he has been spiritually healed. That's very similar to what happens to this woman. Um, Jesus taking the side of the outcast. Yeah, it's a different story. Um, John chooses to narrate it in greater detail. He gives a, a large dialogue. It also happened before Jesus got his major public ministry underway. It's also in John's style. But is anything out of keeping, out of, out of sync with the Jesus of the synoptics? No. Uh, Jesus going to a foreign, possibly previously immoral woman and seeing her as a, a potential apostle to uh, her own people, uh, a sent one. That could be straight out of the synoptics. So you have to look past um, the initial superficial differences. And then while we're in chapter four, the very first few verses, this I would never know from the synoptics, say that Jesus was baptizing. Oh, well, not actually getting in the water. It was his disciples that did it. But, but Jesus was teaching baptism. Whoa. I had no idea. I thought John just did that, got imprisoned for it, and that was the end of that. Well, what's the very first thing the apostles do at Pentecost when they receive the Spirit? 40 days, 50 days, uh, 40 days of resurrection appearances after 50 days, uh, the festival of Pentecost. People are hanging on their every word because of the miracles they've seen. And Peter says, repent and be baptized. Why baptism? If Jesus had moved on from John and that wasn't part of his ministry. Do we have something here at the beginning of John 4 that, that nobody chose to emphasize, but really was a more significant part of Jesus' ministry than we realize? Or was it just something important early on and, and he tried to start to move people away from that to think more about moral issues, but not entirely? Because here's Peter and, and the 11 latching on to it and, and saying this is, this is the fulfillment of what John said. Um, someone is coming who will baptize with water and the Spirit. And Jesus didn't do it himself. He did it through his disciples. He did it with water already through you guys. Now he's doing it with the Spirit as well. And oh my gosh, now we're right back to what Jesus said to Nicodemus. But it's Luke telling the story in Acts, it's not John. So if this is all made up, there are some spectacular interconnections that aren't wow. at the surface level 
you got to yeah. dig to happen to notice them that just coincidentally appear and tie everything together marvelously. You know, as as you were talking, I, I was I was thinking to myself, um, like, how do we know the the Bible is is trustworthy, or you know, isn't just like because I because I I'd imagine if 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 you know our our listeners watchers or anything like me especially before i became a believer and just think you know oh these people thousand years ago you know they didn't even have running water you know like their their waterways were coated with lead you know <laughs> like and and uh they're just a bunch of crazy folks writing up stories just so that way the church of today can capitalize on it and and steal everybody's money from their tithe you know like like so so how do how do we know that that the Bible is real or and can be trusted. I might have lost you as you jumped from leaded water to stealing money with tides, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, now uh, I didn't come here to advertise my books, but uh, the very first thing I ever wrote that's gone through a couple editions is historical reliability of the Gospels more generally. That's um, why I asked you because I, I, I have. Um, <laughs> People have strange ideas. Um, I I don't know what uh, there, we need to have another ism. Um, you can have racism and sexism and and all these other isms. There's there's a snobbery of the recent. Um, that recentism. Recentism. That's right. Ah. That is really endemic in humanity. I mean. It is related to ageism, uh, the idea that a 70-year-old who doesn't have dementia still doesn't have nearly as much to offer as a 20-year-old. I mean, what don't we have to offer? We've got the money. Um, exactly. We've got the wisdom and the education. We might not have the athleticism anymore. Um, <laughs> Though I watched a, a YouTube video of the races in Japan, 100-meter races among centenarians. That was remarkable, 100-year-old men. They were kind of trotting, but they were still racing each other. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, but I digress. Um, our memorization skills absolutely suck in comparison to... <laughs> The people. That's the technical in, term, right? The scholarly terms. It's a very okay. technical term. It's one that my mother, if she was still alive, would be horrified that I would use. <laughs> but for about the mine last too, and she is alive. Years, I've had enough younger people tell me it's okay, so I've started using it. <laughs> people in the ancient I love it. world, schoolboys. Unfortunately, they were just boys. Um, a Jewish schoolboy. Uh, memorized large parts of the Hebrew Bible of what we call the Old Testament. Um, Greek school children memorized the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, Homer's epic works. Uh, a good rhetorician uh, used all kinds of mnemonic devices. Um, we have accounts of those mnemonic devices of how people uh, could memorize huge amounts of information. Um, Stories were passed along, the epic stories of people, of people groups, of communities, um, sometimes with minor details changed, left out, added in, but with the core teachings um, absolutely unchanged for centuries, and, and this completely separate from the Bible. Um, we have got all the technological devices that create retrievability. And so for the most part, we don't have to do it that way. Yeah. Although um, I am still aghast when uh, I go to a store and they say, sorry, our, our uh, computers are down. We can't, we can't uh, check you out. And I say, well, <laughs> here, I learned how to add. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me show you the three things I'm buying. The tax is what, 5%? Okay, let me show you how to figure that. I can write it with a pencil on a sheet of paper. Here's what I owe you. And the the young um, airhead says, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't do that. Um, 
but that's I that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. You know, I was. Oh, go ahead, Will. Well, I was. I was going to say. So, so, uh, <clears throat> like, how 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 do we know that the Bible is trustworthy? Is it because we we rely on people's memory of? you know what they saw what they did and it's it's been like duplicated enough times that we've got like we can triangulate what the truth is or or something we can't prove every last detail uh not even remotely um we can see tons of details to fill large books that archaeologists have come up with that places and people and customs uh, are absolutely true to the time. Um, we can uh, triangulate is a good word, so long as you're not talking about love relationships. Um, at some point, any historian has to make a decision and say, do I see enough reasons, do I see enough evidence in what can be tested to give this document the benefit of the doubt in the places where it can't be tested? And the authors of our world civilization textbooks, whether they know they're doing that or not, uh, many times they're just relying on earlier textbooks. Um, but somewhere back in the day when people thought seriously about these things, uh, <laughs> they uh, said, yes, we've got enough material in the lives of the Caesars that rings true. Uh, we can see that they have some axes to grind. We can also see when they bring us details that cut against the grain, that potentially weaken the ideologies that they're supporting. And they probably wouldn't have included that unless it was true and important. Um, we get to a stage where we say, unless we have some serious reason for doubting a specific piece of information, um, we will give it the benefit of the doubt because you're not going to be able to test everything. You're not going to be able to confirm or disconfirm everything. Uh, the Bible, uh, especially the historical parts of the New Testament, the Gospels and Acts, um, have filled so many volumes of scholarship with those kinds of things that can be tested that it's very reasonable to give it the benefit of the doubt in the places where it can't be tested. Um, and it, I don't know whether to cry or to laugh or some combination of the two when <laughs> people throw out the mishmash of, of kind of arguments uh, that you just made, Will. And I know that you were saying things that people have actually said because I've heard them say that. Um, all I can do at that point is to say, you need some education in the field. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like one of the things that we all hit, right, is that we are, unless we've gotten the specific training on, and that provides us with the knowledge of the methods of historical study provides us the means to see the things, the data and the material, right? I can't do an archaeological dig from my computer. I can read about one, but unless I'm out there digging in the actual ground in Israel and, you know, getting down into the dirt, looking at the different things, I can't. So I have to trust the people that have done that because someone's paid for them to go do that. And so, and it does come down to money somehow. It's all mixed together in some way that money drives it, curiosity drives it, all of it drives these, these endeavors. But like, before we start speaking about the accuracy or inaccuracy of the Bible, we should have some idea of what, 
you know, what we're talking about. And since, or maybe we should ask, am I really educated about this? Do I really know what historians say? More than one, not just Bart Ehrman. Do I know what other historians say? Yeah. Go ahead. And that's true uh, across the spectrum. Um, I yes. uh, have a, a friend, uh, a retired businessman. Um, he is an amateur scientist. He is a thorough student of the Bible. In his retirement years, he leads countless Bible studies. And he came across a video uh, by one of these uh, self-proclaimed um, uh, <laughs> experts who uh, tries to make a case for Mount Sinai actually being in Arabia and not in the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt. And he said, Craig, tell me what you think of this. And I can skim read books. I can skim read articles online. I can't skim read videos. And it's like, okay, whole hour to watch this. Oh, I did it. It was for a friend. If that's all you ever saw, you could think, wow, this is compelling. This guy knows what he's talking about. But it flew in the face of so many other historical and archaeological facts. It contained all kinds of subtle logical fallacies. Um, and I knew something like that was floating around out there because I've heard other people allude to it. And so I tried to point some of these out for my friend and he said, oh, wow. Yeah, thanks. I can see that. I, I won't, I was going to show this to my, uh, my Bible study group in the uh, retirement community. I won't use it now. And I, hallelujah, I did some good. Um, <laughs> but there are other people who, uh, who, who don't take that extra step. Um, there was for a while online, I believe it's been now taken down from all the places you could find it, but there was for a while uh, pictures that looked like you were looking in the depths of murky water, seeing what looked like chariot wheels. And uh, it was supposed to be that they discovered ancient chariot wheels and this somehow proved uh, the truth of the Exodus story. And the whole thing turned out to be a modern hoax that was just concocted up. And I have met people in churches who have said, that is so reassuring to my faith to see stuff like that. And it's like, <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. That's fake. There's enough out there that's real that I can show you that it can be reassuring to your faith, but just don't believe the first thing you see that fits your preconceptions wherever you are. You know, um, I want to I want to ask ask about that because um, <laughs> okay, so um, cards on the table. I believe aliens are real, um, and I've got nothing to prove it. <laughs> Uh, and maybe part of it is just, I just hope that they're real. I don't know. Cause it's just, it's they it'd just, be fun. Yeah. It, it'd be fun. So, but like, and there was, there was a congressional hearing recently about, you know, the unidentified anomalous phenomenon, yeah. AKA UFO. So, so like if aliens are real, like how would that fit into <laughs> the, the larger Bible story or, or would it? <laughs> Does this have anything to do with the uh, purity in John? Um, I'm sure there's a absolutely. I, I'm sure there's a link there somewhere. <laughs> um, if there is uh, extraterrestrial life, then I think the Bible's message is that God created it because He created the heavens and the earth. Um, if it turns out that it is human life, then. Um, there are a lot of things that the Bible teaches that would be true of uh, those individuals as well. If it is not human life, 
then it is still the case that humans are the only uh, species that God created uniquely in his image in order to steward all the rest of creation. Um, I sometimes think it would be not completely different from what happened to Europeans sailing to the quote-unquote new world and discovering what when I was a kid everybody called the American Indians and now that's not appropriate so we talk about Native Americans and when my grandchildren are old they'll probably have another name for them but um Are these human beings? There were a lot of Europeans, especially those that stayed in Europe (laughs) and never had any videos. And all they could allude to were (laughs) letters, sketches, and word of mouth testimony from people who returned. No, those are not human beings. They're they're some primitive species. and then when Darwin came along, oh my goodness, yeah, they're 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 close to being human in the process of evolution. <laughs> Tragically, there were some of my great 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 grandfathers who said that well about some of your great 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 grandfathers. Um, yeah, it is tragic. And then, little by little. The consensus emerged that they were human beings, and that meant there were a lot of things in the Bible that applied to them that uh, hadn't been applied to them previously. My best guess, who knows, is (laughs) that if there's extraterrestrial life, it probably won't be human. Then... Yeah. The, our understanding of the rest of creation has simply been expanded. And we go from there. It, it is not the threat that some Christians think it is, nor is it a disproving of anything like so many non-Christians think. Um, and here's recentism again. Um, We think we are so far advanced in our knowledge of everything. um, We could just be barely at the beginning of the space age if there are (laughs) thousands of more years yet to come. And uh, Christianity is so far bigger than that, that uh, it's fun to talk about, but... uh, I, I do get a kick of the headlines, especially the the online headlines that um, water has been found and such. And it never is the case that water has been found. <laughs> it's always that the circumstances here are such that possibly ages ago, if certain things were right, maybe there was water. And if there was water, then there was one more thing that could have been true, could have been right, could have been needed for some kind of very simple cellular life. And yet we don't know any of that. But we don't know any of that. Nobody's going to click on the headline and get the advertising that I can block out. But apparently most of the world doesn't know how to block out advertising (laughs) um, because they keep using it and they wouldn't use it if it didn't work. Uh, They would not. So the lesson today, if everyone forgets everything, is don't trust headlines. Read deeper. (laughs) And then and then um, given that what comes after the headlines online isn't even one-tenth the length of the average newspaper article, keep reading deeper, and then realize that 
there are things hard to imagine, but there are libraries all over the world that are still standing, even as bookstores die. Mm. There are things called books. <laughs> um, I'm not familiar. I know. Um, <laughs> and the my daughter, who is a PhD in molecular biology and is at the cutting edge of pulmonary uh, research, tells me uh, she very rarely has to use a hard copy book, and it's wonderful. But if you're in the humanities, <laughs> it doesn't matter what field. And if you're in ancient history, oh, my goodness. Um, maybe some have to all the resources will be digitized and cheap enough that there will be a democracy of information like there is for other things on the Internet. But to this day, um, if you want to truly be a student of the Bible, you have to discover books. Um, hmm. And uh, there is not remotely the amount of information, good, solid, dispassionate, accurate information, uncluttered by sensationalism leading to advertisement that you can get online. And uh, I don't know if Gen Z will figure it out. I hope they do. Me too, for all of our sakes. You know, I have a last question, um, and and this will be how we wrap it up. So, contagious holiness, going from aliens to contagious holiness, Cont which could which works because if how do we know if we get touched by an alien if we're going to be pure or not? So we got to figure this out. Uh, not touched by an angel, touched by an alien, dude. That's yeah. a new show, touched by an alien. So. And if we um, find they have a moral dimension to them, then we model for them. Yes, the exactly. Best possible way to live, loving God and neighbor. Yes, loving enemies, um, and it can be catching. Yes, and that's that's the moral of the story. We don't get out the stun guns. We don't have intergalactic warfare. Um, and we won't create a blockbuster in the, the movie theaters. <laughs> yes. And that contagious purity. And the last thing, what, what do we do with the contagious purity that Jesus offers? We live through what the do we spirit, do? A, light of, a life of the fruit of the spirit of... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, against which there is no law. And if there's anybody in Will's world who still is even a closet racist, if he moves to Centennial, Colorado, I want to get to know him, and I want to get to be one of his best friends, and I want that friendship to be seen by others as the right way to live. It's mm. so good. Yeah, that, that, well, that, thank you. That is really good. Um, it's one of the reasons that <clears throat> um, I try to try to be in Josh's life to try to help him through some of his racist ideas. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a journey. Um, we're not quite there yet, but you it's know, an uphill battle for sure. <laughs> for Will. Poor Will. <laughs> He's got to deal with all my ancestry that was in the Confederacy. But we're not going to get into that. We're not going to worry about that. <laughs> I'm from the land um, of Lincoln. We're the, we're the good side. Oh, <laughs> there you go. You're the good side. <laughs> the Southern oppression. Well, yes. Well, it was the war of Northern aggression. We all know that. Right. <laughs> I learned that living in the South for three years. That was amazing. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I remember my, my dad would say, yeah, that's what my grandparents used to call it, the War of Northern Aggression. No, the War of Northern Aggression. That's right. <laughs> I, I learned from a woman my mother's age when I was in my 20s. She said, why? Why, I was in high school before I knew damn Yankee was two words. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. The culture of America is rich <laughs> and with all its dark and light sides. So thank you, uh, Craig, for being on. Thank you. Really You're appreciate it. How can, how can people keep up with your work? Where can they get your book, uh, Jesus is a Purifier, and how can they keep up with your work? Um, 
Amazon hasn't boycotted me yet, or they can go straight to uh, <laughs> Baker Books. I don't just publish with one publisher, but uh, if you Google me, uh, I think most of the hits you'll find have to do with books. Um, if you search for me on Amazon, you'll you'll find what I've written and. Um, Denver Seminary has a website, and they announce new stuff from time to time. I don't personally have a website. Uh, I don't have the time to keep it up. I'd rather uh, be researching and writing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can make your website Blomberg for president. 2024. Well, that, that, hey, hey, that, you're not too old, Craig. That would get No, I realize, but I, <laughs> I think that would give me a heart attack. Uh, sooner than some of the people that in my worst moments I wish could have a heart attack. Um, <laughs> we won't name those people. We won't name those people. Well, thank you again. And uh, to our listeners and viewers, thanks for joining in. This has been Craig Blomberg. Check out his stuff. Go pick up his books. You will not be disappointed, especially if you have interesting questions about the historical reliability of the Gospels or New Testament or any of those things. And this has been Josh, your faithful host, and Will, your political host. And we will see you guys next time. Until then, keep your conversations not left or right, but up. All right. All right. Bye. <laughs>